2000. I'm David Haygood. Thank you for joining us. Well, we have some exclusive breaking news to report tonight. Police need your help in finding a missing Luverne man. We go now to Robin Brooks, who is standing by with more. Robin. Well, David, 23 year old Jason Hudson has been missing now for over 45 hours and friends and relatives are asking for your help in locating him. As we said, Jason Hudson is a 23 year old male from Luverne, Alabama. He has short blonde hair and blue eyes. Hudson is about six foot tall and weighs around 170 pounds. He drives a teal green 1986 Chevrolet S10 two door pickup truck. Neither Hudson nor his vehicle have been seen since 830 Saturday night. Police were notified early this morning when Hudson's mother filed a missing persons report. Here's what one close friend had to say. Jason is one of my very best friends and he's very responsible. This is very unlike him to just leave without telling somebody. Um, he's really good about keeping his appointments and when he didn't show up in Prattville at 6 o'clock Sunday night, that's when we knew that something was wrong. And we did give it a few hours but you can only wait so long and then we called the police. Um, if, if you see him, you see his truck, if, or if you saw him Saturday or Sunday, please call the um, Luverne Police Department. Robin, is there any possibility that Hudson decided to leave the area without telling anyone? Well, David, Jason left all of his belongings at his home in Luverne, so those who knew him very well find it unlikely that he's a runaway. Now, is Luverne the only place that we should be on the lookout for Hudson? That's not the, the case at all. Jason lives in Laverne, but he's also enrolled at LBW Junior College in Andalusia, and he works here in Troy at Sheer Expressions. Jason was also scheduled to meet friends in Prattville on Sunday night, and he never arrived. If someone has uh, information on the whereabouts of Hudson, what should they do or who should they contact? Well, you can contact your local police department, and if you would like to remain anonymous, you can call the Troy Police Secret Witless Witness Line at 334-566-5555. Thanks, Robin. We'll have an update on the search for Jason Hudson on tomorrow night's newscast. Well, traffic around Troy po uh, Troy's post office is usually pretty crowded, but that should change in a couple of weeks. The layout around the post office will change, be changed to include more parking spaces. It will also be a little easier for customers to drop mail in the boxes outside of the office. The postmaster says the changes will help. Okay, what we're doing, we're trying to utilize every possible space to make more parking. We made, uh, we're making uh, seven new parking spaces uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the in the parking lot here at the post office. We're also widening the overflow parking area where we had eight parking spaces that was very hard to use and also knocked down the wall between the employees parking and the customer parking would be much easier for people to back out and get into the to, to, into those eight spaces. Ward hopes even more room can be added in the future. He says the post office will have to buy more property before it can grow anymore. Well, most TSU students know about Saga, but how about Frank's Place? Along with a new look inside, old-fashioned soda fountain and coffee bar, Frank's Place is one of the newest additions to the Frank Stewart Dining Hall. Frank's Place has a sports bar theme with pool tables, arcade games, and nine televisions. It's already open and Marriott Services hopes to provide a nice environment with more food choices. Despite a couple of opening day glitches, Frank's Place is a winner so far. It's been over like five times since it's been open. It's like the fifth time here. It's, um, it's a little bit better than last year because of the uh, food and stuff. I like the hours because like my friends and I will come in and probably about 10 or something like that just to be able to get something to eat you know, after hours is kind of nice. And still to come, a tragic shooting in Arkansas has students on edge as the first day of classes resume. We'll have that story. Plus, Chad Simmons will have a recap on TSU's first soccer match of the season, so stay with us. I bet, I bet you do. I bet you do. Remember the highs, the lows, the pressure, the party? Are you kidding me? You're going to risk your hard-earned cash? Take food off your table? Off your table? Betting on 18-year-old 18 18 kids. kids? You might as well. Throw your money away. Fool. Fool. So watch our games for this kind of this action. This kind of action. Not this. Not this. 
Because if you're banking on me, make your day. Don't, don't, don't bet on it. Don't bet on it. CSU has provided a forum for student directed theater productions in the past. It says 49 people have been DNA tested in the murder cases of two doping teenagers. Trojan starter Mickey O'Quinn picked up the win, and three other pitchers combined to give up only five hits and one run. Well, we're going to have a nice warm up. All this warm Gulf air is going to be building into the southeastern United States. For an early look at the day's news, sports, and weather from the campus of Troy State University, watch TSU News at Noon weekdays. You're watching TSU Nightly News. Welcome back. Two people are dead in apparent murder-suicide at the University of Arkansas. Authorities say the victims are believed to be a faculty member and a graduate student. The two were found shot to death today in an office on the Fayetteville campus. The victims' identities have not been released. The shooting happened on the first day of classes as students gathered in the classrooms of Kemple Hall. The building houses a variety of departments, including journalism, foreign languages, English, drama, and communications. While well, pressure is building for a broad, uh, broader recall of Firestone tires, Drew Levinson has the latest details on what appears to be an escalating problem for the manufacturers. Demanding answers for the American public over what has become a major tire dilemma, congressional investigators met with Bridgestone Firestone executives. What did Firestone know about this problem? What should they have known about this problem during the last eight years? In prepping for a congressional hearing, investigators are seeking documents and trying to find out if the company acted soon enough in recalling six and a half million tires. Uh, old tires. Friday, the investigators were in Michigan asking Ford officials the same questions. The treads are shredding, and most of the tires in question are found on Ford Explorers. The recall earlier this month and the government investigation have prompted hundreds of complaints, including allegations of at least 62 highway related deaths and 100 injuries. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, Bridgestone, Firestone and Ford may face criminal action in Venezuela. The Venezuelan government says the tire maker and automaker are responsible for traffic accidents there and they plan to find them. Ford says it's already recalled 40,000 tires in Venezuela, but in a statement released by Ford, the company claims this recall has nothing to do with the one in the U.S. This one came about because driving conditions there are different. In a relatively small vehicle population, we're seeing quite a large number of tread separations. We asked for an investigation. It showed nothing, so we acted. Though the House is yet to set a hearing date, the Senate Commerce Committee has invited Ford and Firestone officials to testify at its hearing next month. Drew Levinson, CBS News, Detroit. Well, in Los Angeles, a KLM Royal Dutch Airlines now says a large bird may have hit one of its planes and forced it to make an emergency landing. Jennifer Arthur said the Boeing 747 was still climbing when there was a heart-stopping noise. The KLM Royal Dutch Airliner had 449 passengers aboard. It was bound for Amsterdam when less than a minute after takeoff from Los Angeles International Airport, something went wrong. Shortly after takeoff, maybe 20 seconds or so, I heard a uh, kind of an explosion in the right engine. I was on the right side of the plane and then I smelled smoke. There's a great big noise on the bottom of the plane. And um, it was an awful noise. It was very scary and they told her it was normal. At least two engine parts from the 747 were found at nearby Dockweiler State Beach. An officer with the Federal Aviation Administration said the pilot reported engine problems. Then the plane circled over the Pacific Ocean, passengers say, for close to an hour, dumping fuel. We began to panic. We was afraid, very afraid, because to this they didn't uh, tell us what's, what's wrong. The National Transportation Safety Board is investigating. The part I've identified here on the beach is what's called an exhaust nozzle from the aft part of one of the four engines. I don't know which one. Dr. Klaus Mellum, a passenger, says this is his third time he's been aboard a jetliner forced to dump fuel. You cannot land with all that fuel. It's too heavy. And these uh, guys did a perfect job, a standard procedure. So I was not scared at all. No injuries reported, just a bunch of shaken nerves and hundreds of people thankful for a safe landing. Jennifer Arthur, CNN, Los Angeles. 
Well, Mercedes-Benz plans to double its capacity and workforce at Vance in Tuscaloosa County. Mercedes officials announced a $600 million expansion at the site where it produces the M-Class Sport Utility Vehicle. Adding nearly 2,000 new jobs, Mercedes Chief Jurgen Herbert said that the company would increase capacity from 8,000 vehicles annually to 100, or excuse me, 80,000 vehicles annually to 160,000. Governor Don Siegelman, who was also in attendance at today's announcement, said that the state would provide the automaker about 190. Uh, $119.3 million in incentives. The governor also said the state would provide almost $65 million in improvements such as roads and, 50, and a $54.4 million tax break. Mercedes says its total investment since 1994 in Alabama could be more than $3.1 billion uh, once the expansion is complete. Well, Chad Simmons joins me now with a look at sports. And, uh, Chad, it's the week that uh, most TSU football players and fans That's have right. been waiting it's on. It's time to get down to business. It sure is, as uh, Troy State gets set to play this Saturday. That's right. We're going to talk about that right now. Okay. Well, TSU football gets their season underway this Saturday against Alabama A&M. Head coach Larry Blakeney will lead the Trojans into Huntsville to take on the Bulldogs of Alabama A&M. Starting junior quarterback Brock Nutter says the key to this season will be a team that can evolve in different situations. It's all about experience. Uh, there's not a day that goes by during practice or, or just watching film. Uh, always learning something. Uh, like Coach Jake said, we, uh, we ran a lot of different things back two years ago, and, and two years later we've been adding a few things every year. And uh, like I said, just it's a learning experience. The Trojans will be on the road most of this season. Seven of the games this season will be away games, and defensive line coach Tracy Rocker says the Trojans are ready for the road game. No, I, my, um, since I've been here at Troy, I think this team has played much better, much better on the road. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of things less to do out there on the road. You spend more time around your teammates. You concentrate a little bit more on the game plan. You know you're going into a hostile situation. So that, that I love the road. I have no complaints about the road. But you can't beat home field advantage when it comes to playoff time or you, you're bringing Magnese is coming here this year. So that's going to be big. Well, the TSU soccer team started their weekend off pretty rough, but managed to get their game together before Sunday afternoon was over. TSU's first challenge of the weekend was the SEC's LSU. Troy State only managed one shot the entire game Friday afternoon. Lori McClendon took that lone attempt. At the goal, Jessica Murphy made 10 saves on the day. LSU went on to dominate the Trojans 4-0 in both teams' season opener. TSU starting forward Amanda Mason also went down to injury in the first one minute of that game. The Trojans made up for that tough loss on Sunday. They didn't make, the team didn't take long to pick up their first win of the season. They beat Montevallo 2-1, scoring for the Trojans Bridget Boykin in the 15th minute, and Melanie Russell scored at 89-30. That's just after Susan Kavik scored for the Tigers at 88-20 to tie the game. Another 10 saves for Jessica Murphy on Sunday. Head coach Cossum Sheik says he's optimistic about this season. You know, we have a group of good athletic freshmen who will come in and start for us and, and hopefully make a, a good impact. We also have a good group of veteran players, uh, at goal, both at goalkeeper uh, and actually at every position, and we expect them you know, to mix together and to improve uh, our record and improve our team from last year. That's our goal. And the volleyball team is looking forward to getting their season started off this week. They travel to the Tulane Tournament on Friday and Saturday. This year's team is lacking some experience, but head coach Ginger Lowe says some of those inexperienced players will have to grow up fast on the court. We're playing experience on the floor, but we know that we've got some potential, and we're going to be a little um, uh, bumping into each other a little bit at the first part of the season, learning a new offense. But as we go on, then... The um, young ones will get a little bit more experience, a little more confidence, and they'll understand what Division I volleyball is about. Well, we've seen how the TSU Trojans are preparing for their season on the field this year, and last week we saw how some West Coast Trojans were getting ready. The USC Trojans took on Penn State in last night's kickoff classic, and with a wrap-up of that game, here's Mark Morgan from East Rutherford, New Jersey. Prior to Sunday's kickoff classic, Penn State coach Joe Paterno said he couldn't remember one of his teams entering a season with so many unknowns. Paterno's worst fears were realized. In the first half alone, the Nittany Lions had an interception and a blocked punt returned for touchdowns. The offense staggered to minus 19 yards rushing and committed five false start penalties. We've been pretty good in practice. I thought maybe we had that pretty well under control. Uh, 
you know, a couple of those kids haven't played a lot of football, particularly the guards, and then, you know, they get in the game, and you got to play a little, I guess. Pretty much it's not being focused as we should have been on the play that was being called, and a uh, really little bit of frustration did play into that, and uh, really we need to be focused on the plays that are being called and go out there and focus on the count and just running that play. On paper, you know, our defense has so much experience and so much speed. You know, Penn State lost a lot of key players, but, you know, every year they get the best recruit, and so do we. It's just a matter of coming together, and I think we're together a lot sooner than we were last year. Their defense has been like that ever since I've been here. I mean, we've always kind of leaned on them and, and just kind of expected them to come up with some plays and help us out because we've always kind of been struggling offensively. And, I mean, they came out and did it again today. I heard they rushed for something like 22 yards. I mean, that's amazing. Most importantly, we stopped them from running the football, and that was what we knew we had to do. They could not run the football against us because they're going to control the game. And you know in the third quarter they came out and started running against us, and you could feel the momentum start to change, and then we shifted the gear and we were able to put it away. Their defense didn't really do anything to disrupt us. We disrupt ourselves by jumping off sides and and not getting where we need to be at times and not making the right calls. So it was just a whole team thing. We got to make better next week. There was speculation that Penn State quarterback Rashard Casey would be distracted by this New Jersey homecoming amid his ongoing legal woes. But the Trojans' defense had just as much to do with his ineffectiveness, especially in the second half. Even though Casey said he felt that USC didn't contain him, he failed to complete a pass in the second half and was eventually replaced by Matt Seneca. In East Rutherford, New Jersey, I'm Mark Morgan. All right, Dave, let's look at sports tonight. The USC Trojans doing great with that 29 to 5 win. Let's hope our Trojans can really play some games like that. The first game coming up this Saturday. So That's right, and they go into the season with that number three ranking, so everybody, lots expected. Oh. Everybody's ready. Thanks, Chad. All right, thanks. Well, more than 10,000 firefighters are working hard to contain fires in Montana. Crews from around the nation and from other countries have joined the 24 hour a day battle. Greg Lefevre reports from the massive firefighter camp that's been ground zero for the fight against With Montana's fires wildfires. With burning than available firefighters to put them out, the Pentagon is sending in the troops. Good training, good training. 550 soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, went into training on the Valley Fire Complex in western Montana. They will be assigned, just as civilian fire crews, in teams of 20. With these military teams broken down as small as they are, I think these crews can be very effective in a lot of different roles. They join more than 16,000 firefighters already on the Western Fire Lines. Training started in Fort Campbell with additional instruction here. The soldiers will learn how to operate Forest Service water pumps. You'll be using earplugs all the time and chainsaws and hand tools. Out here, we're being trained by the firefighters, but our non-commissioned officers are ensuring that the soldiers uh, have the right equipment or the right place at the right time. We're here to help the nation in any way we can, and I think it's good that we can come out here and help support the firefighters. Our soldiers are physically fit. They got strong backs, but they've never fought fires before. And yet, this training is paramount and, you know, for these soldiers to get out there and safely help isolate and, con isolate and contain the these fires. The soldiers will be under the individual command of their military officers with operations directed by the U.S. Forest Service. The soldiers will be followed by more Army troops from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and Marines from Camp Lejeune. In all, 2,300 military are expected on fire duty in the next two weeks. The men and women will most likely start with mop-up duties, a job now considered critical. With winds and lightning reigniting so many fires, no fire is considered out unless it's cold. Greg LaFave, CNN, Ravalli County, Montana. It's good that we don't have to uh, face those wildfire problems right now. We do need rain, although we did get a little rain over the weekend, Stephanie. We did. I actually drove through Birmingham yesterday and it poured down rain on us. I know my mom and I were happy to see it because we hadn't seen it in a while. And I'll tell you more about that. Our skies, in just a second, our skies outside right now are sunny. The temperature is 97, dew point is 69. The humidity is 50%, barometer is at 28.86 and falling, and the winds are out of the north at 6 miles an hour. Our high today was 97, our low was 72. We had no rain, the sunrise was at 610, and you should expect that sun to set tonight at 712. We're going to take a look at our satellite map. As you can see, we have a few clouds all along northern Alabama, down into the tip of Florida, and along into the Atlantic Ocean. 
Zooming in a little bit closer, we have some storms all along the, the coast of Florida. And you can see we have those clouds in northern Florida, I mean northern Alabama, up into Tennessee. We're going to take a look at our national radar. We have a few storms down into the tip of Florida, up into central Alabama, up into Tennessee. Zooming in just a little bit closer, once again those, those storms down into the tip of Florida, central Alabama, but it's clear out here in the southeast. And as you can see, we have a low pressure system in northern Georgia, a high pressure system resting in the Gulf of Mexico, slowly moving up into Louisiana, and by tomorrow that high pressure system is going to be in Louisiana heading for Texas. Our rainfall through midnight tonight we might see a few showers all along in the southern half of Alabama, the southern half of Georgia, all along the state of Florida, and up along the Atlanta coast. Some of those storms may be severe thunderstorms, um, all in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, but by tonight those storms will be moving out and just resting into the Florida panhandle. There's also a few scattered sh showers out into California, Nevada, Utah, some highs from around the country today. Oklahoma was in, um, reached 100, but down in Alabama we just rested in the 90s like we have for the last few weeks. Tomorrow it's going to be in the hundreds all in the state of Texas and Oklahoma. It may be a few degrees cooler in Alabama, a high of around 94. A look at some of our highs from around the state. Dothan was our high spot at 99, Troy 97. Huntsville was at 92, Birmingham at 93, Mobile reached a high of 97. By tonight, it should be partly cloudy with a 20% chance of showers. Our low is going to be 72. And tomorrow, partly cloudy, hazy, chance of rain, 20%, and a high of 91. For the rest of the week, it's going to be pretty steady. Our highs are going to be in the 90s and lows in the 70s. And that's how it's going to stay for the rest of the week, David. Not anything too much different. So, so just that, just that small chance of rain. Uh, just that typical summertime forecast. Just our typical southern Alabama gonna... forecast. All right. Yes. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Well, the start of the fall semester is also the start of a new season for TSU athletics. This fall, TSU's volleyball team will have to rely on some younger players. Head coach Ginger Lowe and her only senior player, Emily Larson, took a few minutes to preview their season Sunday at the TSU Fan Day. Here's that interview. So our chance now is to visit with several members of the volleyball team. Ginger Lowe is heading into her fifth season as the head coach of the volleyball team. Heads into this season with just one senior, and that's Emily Larson, who is uh, the setter and the quarterback for the team. Okay. And Emily, there's a, uh, there's a lot of responsibility on your, uh, sure. on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about uh, being the only senior and having so much responsibility at the setter position. Um, I'm just getting used to the idea, but it's, I've been here and I'm really looking forward to running the show and I think it'll be a good year. Now you came in um, and replaced the, the returning setter your very first year here, your freshman okay. year, and since then the experience has, uh, it really needs to start paying off this year, huh? Sure does, yeah. One more year, i got to make it count, but every year has been building up to, so hopefully this year will be a good one for us. Now Emily is not only just the only senior, but you don't have very many upper upperclassmen. It's no. a young and inexperienced squad. Yeah, we have um, Emily as the lone senior, and then we have um, uh, uh, Erica Van Nottingham and Andrea Ellisor as our juniors. We have four sophomores and five freshmen. That's, uh, that's a little <laughs> bit daunting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you see the gray hairs growing <laughs> by the moment, but um, we have, and, and the, on top of that, Emily and Erica are the only two with the starting experience. So um, we have uh, another junior, another sophomore, a sophomore and two freshmen right now as penciled in at the starting lineup. So there's not a lot of playing experience on the floor, but we know that we've got some potential and we're going to be a little um, uh, bumping into each other a little bit at the first part of the season, learning a new offense. But as we go on, then the um, young ones will get a little bit more experience, a little more confidence, and they'll understand what Division I volleyball is about. Because when you go from high school to Division I volleyball, it's the difference between night and day. And there's no way you can, you can tell them that, but until they experience it, there's no way they can understand. I, you know, Emily will vouch for that. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on is the fact that 
If you're only going to have one senior, technically speaking, it's good that she's the setter. Oh, you bet. You bet. Or a metal blocker. That'd be fine, too. But um, Emily, as the setter, and again, we compare that to being like a quarterback in a football team, she has to make the decision of which uh, hitter to set the ball to. The hitters will be calling different things, and she has to decide, okay, this hitter's calling, this one needs to have the set because that blocker's doing this and the defense is doing that. So she has to be thinking not just about what she's doing, but what the hitters are doing, what the blockers on the other side are doing, what the defense on the other side is doing. So major responsibility for a setter. What about off the court as far as all the young players out there? You are the only senior. You've been through the war, so to speak. Is there, is there some, um, some responsibility on your shoulder to kind of acclimate them to college volleyball at this level? Yeah, there sure is. There, all of them are asking me questions, you know, things like that. And it's, I definitely have to be, you know, on my best on and off the court, but they're doing well. They're, they want to learn, and, you know, I, hopefully I can be a good example for them. Ginger, let, let me ask Ginger about the schedule if I can. I, I noticed that there, there's some big name volleyball yeah. schools on this schedule. A very difficult task ahead of you from a schedule standpoint. Right. Well, we play Division One, and, you know, the football team's been playing 1AA all these years, and they're heading into D1, but 1A, but all the other sports have been playing 1A for years. So we play UAB, South Alabama, Tulane. Uh, we got Tennessee State. We got the TAC Conference, which in itself is uh, very competitive. That's no cakewalk in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, we've got um, a tournament here in September. In middle week, middle of September, we'll be having uh, Belmont, Bethune Cookman, and High Point come in. So it's a very competitive schedule. Uh, one that uh, will challenge us um, each time we take the court. There's not a time when you can just sit back and say, okay, that's the W, let's pack it away and be thinking about something else because they're the ones that come back and bite you mm -hmm. if you're not taking care of the task at hand. So you've got to concentrate on this and then um, we worry about the, opponent, the next opponent later. You're entering into your fifth season. Mm -hmm. If you can put it into a, a nutshell or put it a, into, a, into a neat, compact philosophy, what is your main philosophy? What is your main approach to coaching these young ladies? Well, Barry, to be honest with you, I guess because I've been uh, involved in the athletics for so long. Um, Troy State has been a part of my life since I was a student athlete. Mm -hmm. And I coached here for 11 years uh, when they were a very solid D2 program and then have been back. And without a shadow of a doubt, for me, it's very important to win. And, and I, I hate to lose. I mean, it stinks. But you win on the court, you win in the classroom, you win with them growing up and being well-rounded young women, and uh, women, young women who will not embarrass the university, who will not embarrass themselves, who not, will not embarrass their parents, and that's what it's all about. The W is crucial, but there's a W that you look at everywhere else, and Emily um, carries almost a four-point overall, and uh, I don't mind telling you, our team GPA was a little over three points. And I'm very proud of that. And we have our girls, and they graduate. And I'm very proud of that. So I guess you might say winning is very important, but winning in the classroom, on the court, and in personal lives, and growing up to be well-rounded young women is the name of the thing, the whole game. That's what it's all about. The volleyball season is upon us. First of September, they are at it. Ginger Lowe, the head coach, and Emily Larson, the senior setter, our guests here at Fan Day, here on the Troy State University campus. Well, we're all looking forward to a big volleyball season. I know you've right. talked with uh, Coach Lowe a couple of times. And, right. They've uh, got a long way to go. Though. A lot of inexperienced players, but if anybody can get them together, Coach Lowe can do it. That's right. In football, we're all ready for a, a big football season, which starts this Saturday. It's Saturday. Coach Blakeney and his team right. uh, will be ready to go. Go out and check it out. That's all the time that we have for this edition of PSU Nightly News. Join us tomorrow at noon for more news, sports, and weather. For Stephanie Hicks and Chad Simmons, I'm David Haygood. Good night. News, New York. David Haygood joins me now with the weather. And David, it has been so hot outside. Is there any relief from, from the heat? It's a relief from the heat. No rain uh, coming in the forecast. Just that slight chance of uh, rain. Like we have had uh, over the past few days, but the uh, temperatures are going to cool down over the next couple of days. We'll tell you more about that in just a second. That's right. The temperatures could cool down over the next few days. As a matter of fact, tomorrow they're supposed to start cooling down. We'll tell you more about that in the weather forecast coming up in just a second. First, let's take a look at what's going on outside right now with your current conditions. Right now it's partly cloudy. Temperatures are 94 degrees. Dew point is at 61. 
The humidity is at 33 percent. The barometer is at 29.83 and steady. The winds are from the northeast at 7 miles an hour. Today's stats, a high around Troy of 97, low of 72. Rain is no, no rain to speak of, just maybe a trace of rain over the last couple of days. Sunrise is at 611. The sunset is at 709. Let's take a look first off at the current temperatures outside right now. You see up in Maine, 77 all the way down to the 70s and 80s. The current temperatures right now most across much of the eastern part of the country. Out here in Texas, though, 103, 104, 101. Yesterday in Mobile, up to 105 degrees, really warm down in the port city. Up in the 60s, up in uh, Washington and 70s in Oregon, 60s and 70s across the state of California. Go ahead, take a look out here. right out here is the uh, heat index, the danger range right here. You see where they're having those 100 degree temperatures, 103, 105 degree temperatures in parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi even yesterday. It got into Alabama as well, the heat index in the danger range. Let's go ahead and take a look at your satellite forecast. You see this big tropical wave that was down in Florida. Watch it intensify right there as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We'll show you more of that in just a second. You see cloud cover going off of the uh, coast of the Carolinas out into the Atlantic Sea. Cloud cover over much of the uh, parts of uh, California, Nevada, that, that part of the country, heavy cloud cover there. We'll take a closer look at the southeastern satellite radar. You see that big disturbance down there off the coast, or in the Gulf of Mexico, rather. That's how big it is, the cloud cover. Let's take a look at what it looks like without the cloud cover. You see just not much to speak of. It pops up there in just a second. Right there, the rainfall out in the Gulf of Mexico. Heavy rains in parts of the Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina, even back in here to, uh, as we said, up under those cloud cover right there from parts of the northern part of California through Nevada and parts of that country or parts of the country. You see the forecast or see the rain in parts of South Carolina into Georgia. No rain to speak of in Alabama. We were clear all day today. Take a look at the surface map. We've got that low pressure front there. Also the low pressure right there dipping down into parts of Alabama and Georgia. Then tomorrow it will dip down even farther. May cause that disturbance out in the Gulf of Mexico to push on down farther and over to the west rather than coming up through parts of Alabama. We've got rain right here across uh, parts of Mississippi tomorrow where we could see a chance of uh, rain as it comes our way into Alabama over the next few days. Your forecast for tomorrow, your rainfall forecast, scattered showers and thunderstorms through parts of Alabama, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, up the eastern seaboard, as well as out in parts of uh, New Mexico, Nevada, California, and that area of the country out there. Then on Thursday, you've got that chance of rain again, much of the same part. Most of Alabama covered in that chance of uh, for isolated thunderstorms, uh, showers and thunderstorms in that. Temperatures right now across the southeast, 95 up in Birmingham, Atlanta at 83, Albany at 85, Jacksonville is at 88, Tampa is at 87. Today's highs though, as you can see, we talked about the 101 degree temperatures in Oklahoma City. We talked about 103 out in Texas. Hot out there. Only got up to about 80 in Maine and up in up in Washington, Oregon. The high there, 64 and 69 degrees. Let's go ahead and take a look at your forecast for tonight. Partly cloudy skies, a slight chance of rain late in the evening, low of 71. Then tomorrow we've got mostly cloudy skies and cooler temperatures, a 40% chance of showers. High tomorrow is going to be 87. That's where the cool down begins. And then the forecast, the four day forecast for Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Chance of rain on Friday, Thursday and Friday and then partly cloudy skies on Saturday and Sunday. And it begins to warm up, Stephanie, on Saturday and Sunday. So enjoy those cooler temperatures tomorrow. But as far as rain goes, it may rain tomorrow. So you want to take that umbrella with you so it won't uh, mess up that hair. I remember that. Thanks, Dave. Sure. Most TSU fans. Remember college? ...answers to what really caused the deaths of his son, along with Princess Diana and their driver three years ago. Fayed believes the car crash was no accident, it was murder. Kathy Moss has the details. Three years after the crash that killed Princess Diana and Dodi Al Fayed, a grieving father still searches for answers. I'm appealing for the support of the American people to help me. Appearing on videotape at a news conference, Mohammed Al Fayed announced plans to sue the U.S. for information.
Joins me now with a look at the weather. David, everybody's excited about the big game tomorrow. Uh, can you give us a little update on the forecast? Well, the Auburn game tonight, you might have thought that it was uh, going to rain later on tonight by the looks of things earlier this morning, but uh, things have changed. The skies have cleared up considerably since this morning, and uh, we'll give you the complete forecast in just a second. That's right, we'll have the complete game day forecast for Auburn as well as Troy State and Alabama coming up. First, let's take a look at the current conditions outside right now. Cloudy skies right now. Temperature is at 86. The dew point is at 68. The humidity is at 33 percent. The barometer at 29. 9.84 and falling winds are from the north northwest at around three miles an hour. Your today's stats high of 88 today here in Troy, low of 71. No rain to speak of. Did have just a trace maybe uh, this morning at around 11:30. We'll tell you more about that in just a second. The sunrise is at 6:11. The sunset was at or the sunset is at 7:08 tonight. Let's go ahead and take a look at the today's highs. As you can see out here in Texas, 106 in parts of Texas, Mississippi, Arkansas even at 106 degrees today. You can see where that line stops though, 106 in Jackson, then 88 in Alabama. That was today's highs uh, here in parts of the southeastern part of the country. The danger range still in effect for the, for, uh, for the heat index. Parts of Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, even up into Kansas, you've got the heat index going into the danger range, so we want to be prepared for that. Alabama, though, in the high and moderate range. So parts of Alabama in the high and moderate range on the heat index, but other than that, everything looks okay. The southeastern satellite or your uh, satellite picture, you see that disturbance out in the Gulf of Mexico still. Parts of Alabama, Georgia covered by clouds most of the day today, which caused the, uh, the cooler temperatures in our part of the country. Closer to home, you see the disturbance over Atlanta. Then again, out here in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, you've got the, all the rain out there. But in Atlanta, Alabama, the heavy cloud cover underneath those clouds, though, you've got that rain. As you can see, parts of the southern, the southeastern part of the country rain just sporadic in different areas of the country just builds up all this afternoon. But the main part was right here in Atlanta in parts of Georgia, northern, uh, central and northern parts of Georgia got heavy rain. Pike County, even you can see there in just a second, pops up with a little rain earlier in the day. Let's take a look at your surface map, the low pressure right there. We got the low pressure over parts of Alabama, which is causing that rain to stick around. It's been around for the last few uh, few days and it's not going to change. Low pressure around still tomorrow, maybe pushing that rain off into Georgia, parts of uh, South Carolina and parts of uh, off the uh, eastern coast there. That's what we're hoping for. Your rainfall forecast for tonight, very hot in parts of Texas, uh, Louisiana and Mississippi, but the forecast, no rain in the forecast. So the weather forecast, the game day forecast for the Auburn game tonight looks pretty good. You just got that slight chance of rain as we do throughout the summer. For the forecast for the thunderstorm forecast, most of Alabama still in the thunderstorm outlook. Severe thunderstorms, though, in parts of Mobile, Baldwin County, all the way through the uh, Gulf Port of uh, Gulf of Mexico, throughout Mississippi and Louisiana in the thunderstorm, severe thunderstorm category. Your forecast for Friday. Much of the same rainfall throughout Ala, throughout Alabama of the eastern seaboard into the New England states. You've just got that chance of showers and thunderstorms. Then again on Saturday, it's that chance of showers and thunderstorms. As you can see up in Huntsville, in case you're wondering about the Troy State game, you've got a 20 to 30 percent chance of rain there. Your temperatures right now in Alabama, 82 in Albany, rather 89 was the high today in Birmingham. But there it is, 102 in Jackson, and that line cuts right there along the Mississippi Alabama border as 89 temperatures, almost a 20 degree difference in parts of Alabama. Your highs for today in Huntsville, 85 degrees in Birmingham. The high was at 89. Phoenix City, the high was at 87. Montgomery was at 88 or currently is at 88. Troy is at 86 and your hot spot Mobile still at 90. Let's go ahead and take a look at tonight's forecast. Occasional rain an 80% chance tonight. It's a good chance, a low of 71. Then tomorrow you've got a uh, rain likely another 80% chance of uh, showers and thunderstorms. High of 85 tomorrow and your four day forecast for Friday. The scattered thunderstorms, highs of 85. Then on Saturday, isolated thunderstorms, high of 92. Saturday and Sunday, go it gets a little bit better, although it's a little warmer with partly cloudy skies, highs of 90 in the lower 90s, 92, 94 on Saturday. So it looks pretty good in case you're wondering about the four day forecast for the uh, games on Saturday for up in Huntsville or games uh, in Los Angeles for Alabama. Looks pretty good out there, too. Right. So uh, Auburn weather tonight, the game for the Auburn weather is going to be pretty good. Pretty good. We, Area we high hope. schools tomorrow looking good. And uh, Troy State games. It's going to be good weather outside. That's right. We hope it doesn't rain tonight for the Auburn game, but All right. we'll keep our fingers crossed. Thanks, Dave. Well, four years ago, as many as... 
Good evening. This is the news for Wednesday, August 6, 2000. I'm David Haygood. Thank you for joining us. Well, the SGA Senate elections were held today in the Adams Center. Student government president Heather Hines says their goal is to fall, uh, fill the Senate vacancies and increase student involvement on Election Day. The polls opened this morning at 8 and closed at 5. Hines says the turnout so far has been fair. We don't know numbers because um, we haven't been keeping up with that just yet. We'll know that at about 5 o'clock today we'll start counting ballots. And it seems to be going well. It seems that, you know, 20 people will come and vote, and then for an hour we won't have anybody vote. So it kind of goes in spurts. Christy Babson will have complete coverage on the elections tomorrow night at 5. Well, Troy State will broaden their worldwide university system starting next year. The newest part of TSU will be in Malaysia. Officials at NT College signed an agreement with Troy State last week to become partners. University College Vice President Rodney Cox says TSU will offer a wide range of degree programs. We have about 54 sites teaching under the Troy State Imprimatur, and whether it's in five countries, uh, in 12 states, and three protectorates around the world. So we are very much, as you can see the map back here, yeah. we're very much around the world with, uh, with our programs. With TSU's help, NT College in Malaysia will offer associate, bachelor, and master degree programs in business, social sciences, computer, and information technology. Well, fraternities and sororities are usually known for parties and drinking, but they're trying to change their image. The, T, uh, the TSU Pan, uh, Pantheletic Council and the Inf Fraternity Council are two of the groups sponsoring this year's anti-drug message. The 11th through the 14th is National Drug Awareness Week. As part of the celebration, a nationally known motivational speaker and actor, Milton Craig, will take the stage to deliver a message about drug-free living. Dean of Library Services and one of the organizers of the event, Dr. Henry Stewart, said Krieg's message was one college student should definitely hear. Krieg, who has, been spoke, who has spoken to more than 8 million students during the past decade, has contributed positive message work to the Fox News Network, BET, and Trinity Broadcasting's network, Praise the Lord. Well, anglers from Pike County and the surrounding area will have a good excuse to wet a worm for a good cause in a couple of weeks. The Lockheed Martin March of Dines Fishing Tournament is set for Saturday, September 23rd. Contestants will have to catch their fish early. First cast is at 6 a.m. and the last fish must be in the boat by 11. The entry fee for the tournament is $10 per person and is open to everyone. People who just want to watch can do so for free. Lockheed will host the fishing tournament at their own Dennis Smith Lake. If you'd like to find out more information, contact Jill Strickland at 670-9559. A fugitive from Tennessee has been arrested by Dothan Police. 24-year-old Troy Bodenheimer of Chattanooga is charged with possession of marijuana. But Dothan Police Chief John White says the suspect is also wanted for a number of felonies in Hamilton County, Tennessee. Police also recovered $3,000 worth of merchandise that was purchased with credit cards that Bodenheimer allegedly stole in Atlanta. Two juvenile females uh, with, were with Bodenheimer and police say the teenagers will be turned over to their parents. Bodenheimer faces ex uh, extradition back to Tennessee. The fugitive was picked up at a Labor Day checkpoint. During that operation, police charged four people with driving under the influence, four suspects with drug violations, and 10 others were arrested on outstanding warrants. And still to come tonight, a Huntsville school principal has been arrested for soliciting sex. But first, why are nearly 40 Chinese Olympic athletes not going to the summer games? We'll have the answer for you when DSU Nightly News returns. I bet, I bet you do. I bet you do. Remember the highs, the lows, the pressure, the party? Are you kidding me? You're going to risk your hard-earned cash? Take food off your table? Off your table? Betting on 18-year-old 18 18 kids. kids? You might as well. Throw your money away. Fool. Fool. So watch our games for this kind of this action. This kind of action. Not this. Not this. Because if you're banking on me. To make your day? Don't. Don't. Don't bet on it. Don't bet on it. TSU has provided a forum for student-directed theater productions in the past. Since 49 people have been DNA tested in the murder cases of two Dothan teenagers. Trojan starter Mickey O'Quinn picked up the win and three other pitchers combined to give up only five hits and one run. Well, we're going to have a nice warm-up. All this warm Gulf air is going to be building into the southeastern United States. 
For an early look at the day's news, sports, and weather from the campus of Troy State University, watch TSU News at Noon weekdays. You're watching TSU Nightly News. Welcome back. A Huntsville Middle School assistant principal has been arrested for allegedly soliciting sex from a minor. This begins our look at news from around the state. The arrest comes after an undercover investigation by the Athens Police Department. 50-year-old Larry Mark Colburn, an assistant principal at Stone Middle School, allegedly solicited sex from an undercover police officer who pretended to be a 14-year-old girl chatting online. Lieutenant Tracy Harrison says Colburn has had correspondence with the undercover officers for about two weeks before they set up a date for sex last night in an Athens apartment complex. Colburn was arrested by officers when he arrived. In other news, the agency that oversees Alabama's daycare centers wants to lower the ratio of children to workers and mandate more training for workers. Owners say that the mandate would translate into higher costs to parents for the second time in three years. The Alabama Department of Human Resources wants to pass new rules. Officials say it needs to upgrade its standards, which haven't changed in 12 years. They also say, uh, say their rules are among the nation's least stringent. Under a proposal before the Legislature's Joint Committee on Administrative Regulation Review, the new rules would require one worker for every six children under the age of 18 months. That number would be reduced to five children, then to four over an ensuing two-year period. An emergency, rescue, an emergency rescue drill on live Taiwan, Taiwanese television went horribly wrong today as police helicopter went out of control and plunged into a river. The crash left the helicopter's co-pilot in a coma and injured four other crew members. The helicopter was lowering a policeman over a river in the southern county of Taiwan, uh, Taiwan uh, 124 miles south of Taipei, which, which is tilt, when it tilted briefly and dropped into the water. When the chopper took off again, it began spinning in place. Seconds later, the aircraft plunged into side, uh, sideways into the water and fragments of its blade flew off in different directions. Officials said the engine failure might have caused the French-made helicopter to spin out of control. While well, a hostage siege is now underway at a Bank of, uh, Bank of America branch in California near Los Angeles. Officials don't know much at this time. One television station says it began uh, as a bank robbery. Then the robber emerged from the bank, saw police, had surrounded the building, and he went back inside. Details are sketchy. However, there are hostages. Television news coverage shows the police around the bank branch. We still have more on the event taking place in tomorrow night's. We should have more on the events taking place in tomorrow night's TSU Nightly News. While well, several Olympic athletes are being cut from China's roster for the Summer Games in Sydney, Australia. And it's not their performance that's keeping them at home. CNN's John Raebler explains from Sydney. The first confirmation that some Chinese athletes would be staying at home came at a press conference in Sydney. International Olympic Committee officials saying China had been conducting new tests on its athletes for the endurance enhancing drug known as EPO. They have found some athletes above the index, which have been decided and accepted by the executive board of the IOC. And therefore, the Chinese Olympic Committee has decided not to send these athletes to the game. The IOC medical officer added his information pertained only to seven Chinese rowers. Later, further confirmation of the withdrawals from the Secretary General of the Chinese Olympic Committee in Beijing. Indeed, several of our athletes will not attend the Sydney Olympic Games. The reasons are very simple. The first is that in the course of conducting blood tests, we found suspicious results, suspicious, in several athletes. The Chinese official did not say how many athletes had produced the suspicious results. He said some of those not going to Sydney had been withdrawn from the team because of injury and illness. CNN has learned Chinese officials informed the Australian Olympic Committee that 27 of their athletes would be withdrawn. 14 track and field competitors, seven rowers, four swimmers and two canoeists. But the Chinese communique did not say how many of those withdrawals were related to the tests for EPO. IOC officials were quick to put a positive spin on this latest drug controversy. This is a great step forward. I mean, the fact that, that now anybody who might be inclined to use EPO knows that he or she could be caught um, increases the chances enormously that they won't do it. 
EPO is said to stimulate production of oxygen-carrying red blood cells, which increase an athlete's endurance. The IOC has approved stringent new tests for EPO at the Sydney Games, which start next week. John Raidler, CNN, Sydney. Chad Simmons joins me now at the uh, sports desk. And Chad, the 40 Chinese athletes aren't going to be the only ones not making the trip to Sydney. That's right. Later on, we're going to tell you about our big tennis stars not going to be there as well. But first, we're going to talk about some TSU football. The Trojan football team will go into this Saturday's game against Appalachian State, ranked number two in the Sports Network Division I AA poll. The problem is that the Mountaineers are ranked number four in that same poll and coming off an impressive 20-16 win over Wake Forest last Thursday. The Mountaineers only lost two offensive starters from last year's 9-3 team, but Appalachian State has ex inexperience on several teams, on special teams. Just one starter is back from 1999. That game gets underway in Kid Brewer Stadium at 7 local time. That's 6 p.m. for us here in Troy. And the TSU volleyball team will have their home season opener tomorrow night against the South Alabama Jaguars. The team finished second place in the Kathy Tross Claire Invitational Tournament in New Orleans last weekend and defeated Alabama State on Labor Day. Head coach Ginger Lowe said the team saw a few problems this weekend they need to work on before the Thursday game. And we were doing, the only thing where I would say we didn't perform on all cylinders was uh, our blocking and our serving. We're still missing, we missed a lot of serves this weekend because we changed our serve to a heavy serve and it requires a different kind of toss. Um, the second match we played Northwestern State, beat them in three. Uh, they had some big old tall, tall girls that could put the ball down, but we just outpassed them and we out defensed them. I mean, we just, we played and we out hit them. Men's Olympic 200 and 400 meter champion Michael Johnson is ready for some action in Sydney. Johnson won the 200 meter in the 96 Atlanta Olympics and set a world record in the event of 19.32. That's four tenths of a second faster than anyone has ever run. He also went on to win the 400 meters in Atlanta and completed the first men's 200 and 400 double in Olympic history. With all these accomplishments, much of the world is waiting to see what Johnson will do at the 2000 Sydney Olympics. You're trying to repeat at the Olympic Games. How important is the sense of history? Um, well, it's important to go into the Olympic Games to win, number one, just for the, because it's the Olympics and you know that uh, everyone's at their best and you're competing against the best at their best. So it's important just to win, whether you know it's repeating or not. So that's the most important thing. But uh, you know, my, my, hist my, my career has been made and built on making history. And so this is just another uh, another way for me to make history and be the first to do something, something that's never been done before, and that's always a, a bonus for me. But it is just that, it's a bonus. It's not the reason I'm going to the Olympics. Uh, if it had been done before, I'd still be going there with the same ambition to go in there and win. Do you think you have a serious rival? Nobody's out there for second place, so everyone's a rival to me. Um, and everyone's out there to, uh, to win, and only one person can. So. I don't really look at, uh, you know, what times guys have run or how fast they're running. If they get in that final, anything can happen. I've got to be on top of my game in order to, to go in there and win. The other issue, of course, is drugs. The Sydney organizers say they have state-of-the-art equipment. This is going to be a drug-free games as best as they can manage. Do you feel confidence that the, uh, the cheats won't prosper at this game? Uh, whether or not you know, the cheats will prosper or won't prosper, I still got to go out there and compete. And if there are people cheating and they don't get caught, then, you know, you have to assume they're clean. And no one's going to give me a gold medal if I'm beat by someone who's using drugs, but they don't test positive. I'm still going to get a silver. So I've got to go out there and beat whoever lines up uh, on that line. That's all I worry about. I don't spend my time concerning myself with whether or not someone that I'm competing against who's never tested positive for drugs is on drugs or not. And you're determined to go out at the top? This will definitely be my last Olympics. At this point, there is, there, there, there's nothing else that I want to achieve in the sport that I haven't already achieved. All of the goals that I've set for myself, I have achieved those. And so I came in the sport on top, and, and I'd like to leave that way. Prediction? About what? Well, the two races you're going to run in. 400, I think that I'll win. 4 by 400 relay, I think we'll win. And in more Olympic news, defending gold medalist Andre Agassi will skip Sydney. He announced today that even though the Games are among his top priorities, he won't be at the Olympic Games. Agassi quit the team for personal reasons a little 
more than a week before the opening ceremony. Last week, Agassi announced that his mother and sister are both fighting breast cancer. No replacement for the tennis team for Agassi has been announced. And finally, this evening in sports, don't expect to see Troy Aikman on the field this Sunday when Dallas travels to Arizona. Aikman went down in the Cowboys season opener with his ninth concussion. Aikman underwent three days of medical evaluations by teams, training staff, and outside physicians before the decision to keep him out of the game was made. There's no timetable set for Aikman's return to the team. Dave, that's a look at sports this evening. Maybe time for Aikman to just hang it up. Nine concussions, that's a lot. Well, that's a lot of concussions, and I heard uh, some of the sportscasters say that that was uh, one of the worst games of his career this past Sunday. So that's right. Let's see what comes about. All right. Thanks, Chad. Well, in this edition of Your Health, Judy Fortin examines the problem of bursitis. It can hit whether you're an athlete or not, and rest is the best way to ease the pain. Exercise can take its toll on an athlete's body, but you don't have to be a professional to suffer from a condition called bursitis. The pain is often felt near joints in the shoulder, knee, elbow, or other body part where bursa are located. They are tiny sacs of fluid that cushion pressure points in the body. Too much friction or pressure can cause the sacs to become inflamed. The symptoms may start out as a dull ache or stiffness, and it worsens the more you move. Rest is often the best treatment, but a doctor may advise you to take aspirin or ibuprofen to reduce the pain and inflammation. Stretching before you exercise is one of the best ways to prevent bursitis from occurring in the first place. For more health news online, go to cnn.com slash health in association with WebMD. For your health, Judy Fortin, Headline News. Well, many towns have annual traditions when all of the residents turn out to take part in various festivities. But here's one that may seem a little bizarre. As Denise Dillon reports, it involves adults throwing fireballs at each other. Fireworks that light up the night sky are just the beginning of the fireball festival in El Salvador. Down on the ground is where the real action takes place. There are no rules. Just a lot of fire. Using all their force, men launch blazing fireballs at each other. This is an annual festival in the village of Nejapa, about 30 miles outside San Salvador. It's been going on for so long, most aren't even sure of the festival's origin. Apparently, there are two stories behind the tradition. One centers around a mountain filled with fire, the San Salvador volcano. And a day back in 1658, the deadliest eruption of the San Salvador volcano, when some say it showered incandescent stones through the air, the fireballs resemble those stones. This festivity is celebrated in memory of our ancestors who used to see the eruption of the San Salvador volcano and used to pass fireballs at each other. The other story concerns the town's patron saint, Saint Geronimo. Saint Geronimo would go to the mountains and would use fire when he confronted the devil in protecting the town of Nehapa. These days, the people in town focus on the fireballs and hurling them at each other. They save old rags and soak them in a mixture of flammable fuels for weeks. Surprisingly, there are few injuries and rarely any major unplanned fires. Some say that's because the patron saint is watching over the festivities. Denise Dillon, CNN. Well, you wouldn't have been throwing many fireballs around Troy today as uh, rain was all over the place. In That's forecast. right. The rain would have definitely wiped out the fireballs if anybody had tried. Hopefully nobody didn't. I'll tell you all about that rain right after we take a look at our current conditions. Outside right now, it is overcast, temperature of 73. Our dew point was at 64. Humidity was at 95%. Our barometer was 29.95 and steady, and winds were out of the northeast at 14 miles an hour. Our high today was 75. Our low is 70. Rain, we had one and a half inches of rain. Sunrise was at 623, and our sunset is going to be at 702 tonight. We're going to take a look at our U.S. satellite map, and as you can see, we have complete cloud coverage all along Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, all over the coast of Florida. And as we know, the reason for that cloud coverage, we had rain today. Rain all in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, all along the Atlantic, Atlantic coast. If we take a look at our southeast um, radar map, 
the rain was um, located within central Alabama, central Georgia, all along Florida and in South Carolina. A little bit closer, we see that that rain was all in Troy, all the way up to Birmingham and all through central Georgia. And taking a look at our current surface map, we had a low pressure system resting in the Gulf of Mexico um, along with the jet stream coming through Alabama which uh, contributed to that participation that we had today but by tomorrow that low pressure system is going to be moving out of the Gulf of Mexico but that jet stream still hanging around in Alabama. And of course we had rain today a uh, heavy rain located in South Alabama and South Georgia, but we had rain all along the southeast um, as well as rain up in the Midwest states. And tomorrow, same thing, heavy rain all along the southeast, all through Louisiana, uh, the western part of Texas, the eastern part of Texas, and through Florida and along all along the southern states. But by Friday, same thing, rain, but not quite as heavy. The rain is just going to uh, die down a little bit and just be mm, just showers, but no, no thunderstorms. Um, our current temperature is outside. Very cool today. 70 in Birmingham. It was only 76 in Miami. And over here in Texas, where they had 100s last week, only in the 70s. Uh, same thing in California, only in the 80s. Very cool for this time of year. Taking a look at temperatures from around the state, Huntsville was at 75, Birmingham at 71, Troy 75 degrees outside, Dothan a cool 60.